So Lord, we pray that you would breathe on us, that you'd speak your word into us like the valley of dry bones and that we would rise and we would enter the land like you promised to Israel, like you prophesied through Ezekiel. I'm just asking you, Lord God, to help us preach the gospel. In Jesus' name, amen. About uh, 25 years ago, I was preaching through uh, First Peter, and when I got to these verses that we're looking at today, um, <clears throat> that, that we read also last time, last time we preached on Peter, and, and I told a story at that time, a story that had just happened, but in a way it keeps happening because I've been chewing on it and pondering it for 25 years. Several years ago, we made a little movie about it that you can watch online. About one year ago, I shared it with you in one of our sermons on Romans titled Seeds of Hope and Where They Grow. I shared it, but I forgot that I had, had shared it until last Wednesday afternoon when I had already been chewing on this sermon for a few weeks. And so I'm just saying I, I want to share it with you again because it hasn't stopped teaching me. And I kind of think maybe God tricked me into sharing it again because I think he still wants to use it to teach all of us. 26 years ago, when my children were only three, six, eight, and nine, they uh, had a dream. They dreamed of a magic kingdom. They dreamed of a whole new world, Disney World was an impossible dream in my mind because we just couldn't afford it. But an old friend from California made me an offer that I just couldn't refuse. He offered us a week's stay at one of the Disney World Resort parks, you know. And it came with some passes. And all we had to do was, was get there. We couldn't afford to fly, but I figured that we could drive because we had a minivan. I came up with the idea of surprising the kids for really, I think, two reasons. The first was something that Gandalf said to Frodo at the end of their journey in the Lord of the Rings. He said, many folk like to know beforehand what is to be said on the table, but those who have labored to prepare the feast like to keep their secret, for wonder makes the words of praise louder. And so I cherish the moment of revelation when their faces would just light up and wonder would make the words of praise ever louder. I love you, Daddy. I love you. And secondly, I just knew that if I told them too early that we were going to Disney World, they'd just drive me crazy and might literally blow up from a combination of joy and longing that we call hope. It had been a couple years earlier that I had had something like my own Damascus Road experience with God, and I sincerely thought that I was going to die from an overload of, of, of joy, ecstatic joy. And for 30 years, it's created in me an ever-growing, wonderful, profoundly painful longing called hope. Well, as summer approached, the kids, you know, they just pressed for information about vacation, and I didn't want to want to lie. So I planned out the route and realized that we would going, be going through Junction City, Kansas, uh, my birthplace. And so one day, when they were just pressing me for information, what are we going to do for vacation? What are we going to do for vacation? And I said, Kansas. We're going to Kansas. And I remember they all said, Wow! What's in Kansas? And I said, stuff. Stuff's in Kansas. You know, stuff. They got stuff like motels and swimming pools. We're going to see stuff. We're going to see stuff. They put their hope in Junction City, Kansas. I remember taking them to McDonald's one day. It was around that time. And their Happy Meal toys were these pro promotionals for Disney World, the Animal Park or something. And I remember Elizabeth, she was uh, just looking at her, her toy that she got with her Happy Meal, and she said, Daddy, this is so cool. I said, honey, what is it? And she said, oh, wow, Dad. Her eyes got big. She said, it's, it's this land. It's this land, special land. I said, where is it? And she said, Orlando. 
something like that. And, and then I remember she kind of caught herself and she said, but daddy, we could never go. It's really, really far away. We could never go there. I was just bursting inside. But I forced myself to say something like, well, honey, we're going to have a good vacation. Trust me. Faith is trust. It takes faith to hope. For without faith, we seize control of hope. And then it's no longer hope. It becomes a lifeless idol that destroys the one that holds it. Well, anyway, they dreamed of Junction City, Kansas. The day finally came, May 28, 1998, our 15th wedding anniversary. Early that morning, we set out on I-70 for Kansas. If you subtract four hours of potty breaks, it's about a six-hour drive from Denver to Junction City. Then one more hour, seven hours in total, to Kansas City, where we'd rest for the night, and then in the morning, we'd get on our way back on the road to the Magic Kingdom. It was a long van ride for the kids. So when we exited I-70 for Junction City, they were pretty excited. I mean, John was looking for motels, I remember, with swimming pools. They were all talking about seeing the place where daddy was when he was a little boy. I remember we drove past this dilapidated old bowling alley and they all said, daddy, daddy, it's a bowling alley. We could go, could we go bowling? And I said, maybe, maybe. Soon we arrived at the church that my dad had pastored right next to the beautiful old manse, the house in which I once lived. I had called ahead and now the pastor was waiting for me. His name was Dick Underhall Pierce. He showed us all around uh, the church building. My kids had these disposable cameras, you know, that my parents had bought for them to take pictures on, on vacation. As he showed us around, they kept saying, I want to take a picture, I want to take a picture. And, and we'd say, well, you might want to save some film. Now that's a concept that some of you don't understand, but back in the day, that was a thing. We might want you to see, there might be other things that you'd want to take pictures of. And they said, like what? And I'd say, well, stuff, you know, just, just stuff. Trust me. And then the pastor, he took us next door and he showed us the manse, the house that I grew up in. After that, we sat down on the front steps across from the park where I used to play when I was a little boy. And Coleman, he just locked his eyes, you know, on the playground and in the park. I was videotaping. Susan got the secret bag out of the van. Then I began this prearranged dialogue with Pastor Underhall Pierce. So what's to do here in Junction City, I said. And he said, oh, wow, well, you know, we got a lake. You could go down and take a walk around the lake. And I said, well, you know, we, we got a lake in Colorado. So well, you could go to the bowling alley and we got miniature golf. And, and I said, you know, we got bowling and miniature golf in Colorado. The kids, they were looking at me like, are you nuts or evil? Or, you know, what's going on, dad? We've already seen the church and the manse, I, I mused. It seems like there's really nothing else to do here in Junction City. I mean, we might as well just, you know, get back in the van and, and keep going. The, the kids were confused. They were starting to press. But, Daddy, no, no, no. The, I, the bowling. I would like the bowling game, they said. And then I asked the pastor. I said, hey, you know, um, what happens if you stay on that road, I-70, out there and just keep going? And he said, well, wow, you know, if, if you went on that road and you kept going, you kept going east and, and you went far enough east and then you like took a right well eventually you'd end up in Florida and then he turned to my kids and he said hey do you guys know of anything in Florida and they ventured a, a few guesses and finally Elizabeth said um uh Disney World and at that I said hey let's go to Disney World and Elizabeth said, I'd rather stay here. <laughs> and then Susan said to John, John, do you want to go to, do you want to, go to Disney World? And he said, um, I'll think about it. 
Coleman and Becky were still clueless. They just kept looking at the park. So Susan and I pulled the Mouseketeer hats, you know, out of this secret bag. We put them on the kids, and then we put them on ourselves, and we started dancing around, saying, we're going to Disney World, we're going to Disney World, we're going to Disney World, we're going to Disney World. And John said, are you serious? And I said, yeah. Oh, Mom, Poppy, you know about it? Non and Pop, we've been planning it for months, and we're going to go to, we're going to just get a good night's sleep, and then we're going to Disney, we're going to the beach. It's going to be, it's going to be in, incredible. I'm serious. And Elizabeth said, but... But, 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 but how many days are we going to stay here in Junction City? And at that, I, I just turned off the camera. Totally frustrated, I said, get in the van. Just get in the van. And Coleman, I remember, he said, shoot! I wanted to go to the park! And then Becky, sweet little Becky, she just said, I don't want to get in the van. I think it was the most anticlimactic moment of my life. I was embarrassed. Susan was embarrassed. I mean, we figured that pastor, the pastor must have thought we had the most spoiled kids in the entire universe. I was walking them back to the van. I remember I, was, I made them get in the van. I was walking around the back of the van. And as I'm walking, this, this thought occurred to me. And I think it came from, from God. Hey, Peter. Now you understand what it's like for me to be your daddy. See, it's not that my children's hopes were too big. They were far too small. It would seem that the Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak, writes C.S. Lewis. We are children content to play with mud pies in a slum when a holiday at sea has been offered to us. And don't get me wrong, mud pies would be fun for a time. Junction City would be fun for a time. But after three weeks of sitting in front of the Tasty Freeze, languishing in 100 degree heat, Junction City would turn into hell. Hell number one, that is. The weeping and gnashing of teeth. But you can relate, can't you? I mean, Junction City was in their grasp. The Magic Kingdom was a painful van right away. The Magic Kingdom uh, was a painful right away, and Junction City was in their control. Uh, in their control. But, but the Magic Kingdom, it, it looked like death. Getting the van sounded like pick up a cross and come follow. Once upon a time, a 600-year-old man named Noah heard a voice. Noah, build an ark. Noah, I'm taking you to a new world, and I'm destroying this world of corruption. And Noah said, even the bowling alley? Once upon a time, a tired, beat-up old shepherd was wandering on a mountain in the middle of nowhere, and he heard that same voice. It came from a bush. Moses, I'm the God of your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I have seen the affliction of my people. I've come to deliver them from bondage to a land flowing with milk and honey. Moses, I send you. And Moses said, but I don't know the way. And God said, you will build an ark. I'll meet you at the ark, and I will make a way. And the entire way, the children were terrified of the ark. They sat in the back of the van just complaining, the fish was better in Egypt. And once upon a time, that same voice came from the lips of a man. He preached, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Follow me. I'm the way. And the children said, but um, we really like it here in Junction City. To one of them named Peter, he said, when you were young, you used to walk wherever you wanted, but when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death Peter would glorify God. And Peter must have thought to himself, I'd rather go fishing for fish. But Jesus had already told him, Peter, your dreams are too small. I'm going to make you a fisher of men. As you know, if you've been listening to our sermons from 1 Peter, Peter was crucified in Rome 
under Emperor Nero in 64 AD. A few years earlier, he had written the letter that we're studying right now. In chapter 3, verse 17, he writes this, For it's better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than to do evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body or the flesh, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience, consciousness. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live for the rest of the time, the chronos, in the flesh, no longer in human passions, but in the will of God. For the time that is past suffices for doing the will of the Gentiles, the unfaithful, moving about in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. With respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery and they malign you. But they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is why the gospel was preached, even to those who are dead, that though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. The end. The telos the perfection, the completion of all things is at hand. So there is an end to all things, which means that all things are on a journey to that end. The only thing that doesn't come to an end is the end. Jesus said, I am the end, and the beginning, and the way. Peter ends his second letter with this statement, to him be glory both now and to the day of eternity, the eternal day. We started talking about this last time. All creation is on a journey. Noah and the seven, Moses and the Israelites, Jesus and the seven, all on a journey. The Bible's full of journeys, and children complaining on those journeys to God, whom Jesus said is our dad. He told all of us to pray, saying, our dad, our father. Was he lying? I don't think so. Your life is a journey from beginning to end, conception to death. Every, wor- every week is a journey, right? From Monday to to Sunday, but, but on Sunday, it's not all good, it's not all finished, and so we start over longing for what? An endless Sunday. Do you ever ask the question, why are we on this journey? Well, just like I mapped out our route from Denver to Junction City and on to the Magic Kingdom, I think our Father mapped out our route from beginning to right now and then on to the end, and I think he even told us the route. In the beginning is the start of Genesis chapter one. Then we read about six days of creation, kind of like six hours of driving. Toward the end of the sixth day, man is made in the image of God, and on the seventh day, God rests. In the same way, at the end of six hours of driving, we came to a junction. A junction is a place where a decision is is made. And I knew that if we didn't get stuck in Junction City, but got back onto in the van and onto I-70 and, and went to Kansas City and it had a good night's rest, well, well, we'd just be good to go for the Magic Kingdom. The kids would be good to go. On the seventh day of creation, quote, everything is good and it is finished. 
For on that day, and and now I quote, God rested from all the work that he had done in creation, and he called it holy. So here's a pertinent question. Where are we on this journey? Are you finished? Is everything good? Are you the perfect image of the invisible God? You know, the Bible describes the seventh day when all has been made, and and then it goes back and describes how God makes Adam. That's the sixth day. And that's a rather important observation, for most folks seem to think that the perfect seventh day came and went thousands or millions or billions of years ago. They think everything was perfect until Adam, which means mankind, until Adam and Eve screwed it up. But it wasn't. I mean, if everything was very good, why was there a wall around that garden? How do you explain that lying snake and and two naked people that did not know good from evil? That's not good. God himself says it's not good before the fall. This is so important. He says it's not good before it's not good that the Adam, humanity, is, is alone. It's Peter that tells us, don't ignore this one fact, that with the Lord a day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as a day. And a thousand in Greek is like a bazillion or gazillion in in English. It's the largest numerical denominator in in Scripture. Peter reminds us of that, and it's Albert Einstein that reminds us that a day really is just like a billion years, and a billion years actually is just like a day, depending on where you're standing. Because time is relative to the speed of light somehow. And God is light. You see, if you take your cues from the meaning of the text rather than our antiquated modern notions of time, it's rather obvious that Genesis chapter 1 is like the history of all time. And and that means that most of us still move about in the sixth day of creation. You know, Jesus even said, my father has been working, he is working, he's still working until now. The seventh day doesn't start until Jesus, the word of God and perfect image of God, hangs on a tree in a garden at the end of the sixth day and the junction of space, time, and eternity, and he cries out, it is finished. To tell us thy. It's the telos. It's at that tree that we are given eternal life. That's life of the age to come. And so we now move about in time with eternity in our hearts like an imperishable seed planted within us and now hopefully beginning to fill our entire temple with grace the substance of the seventh day even as we make this journey through chronos through time and that means that the big story is not that God made everything good, we mess it up, and now he's trying to fix it with Jesus. It means that the big story is that God is making us in his image, with his word, who is Jesus, and he will not fail. His word will accomplish that for which he sent it. It means that our Father is taking us on a journey, and we will all arrive at our destination, but on the sixth day we find ourselves at a junction. It's it's a place where we make a choice. Or, to be more accurate, it's the place where the Father harvests a choice that he has made in us and has grown in us. It's the place he makes us with his choice. It's the place where his choice becomes our choice, and so we consciously choose to get in the van. Jesus is the van. Jesus is the Father in flesh. Jesus is the way. Jesus is the beginning and the end. Jesus is the plot to the whole story. Jesus is the grace of God. Jesus is the judgment of God. The Father's choice in us 
which is his judgment in us, is called faith. And our choice, surrendered to the Father's choice, is called salvation. He saves us from our bad choices with his good choice. 1 Peter 3, 20. Eight persons, that's seven plus one, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the flesh, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience or consciousness, sunodesis, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, through the resurrection. So we say we're saved by just the death of Jesus, like he had to kill someone to feel better about us. And here he says it's through the resurrection of, of Jesus who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. In 1 Corinthians 10, Paul tells us that when Israel passed through the Red Sea at the start of the journey, they were baptized into Moses. That's what Paul writes. Ate the same spiritual food, drank from the same spiritual rock, which was Christ. And so I hope you get this amazing picture that runs really throughout all of Scripture. In Genesis 7, Noah and the seven are baptized and they begin a 40-day journey to a new world. In Exodus, Moses and Israel are baptized, and they begin a 40-year journey to a new kingdom, a magic kingdom, flowing with milk and honey. In the Gospels, Jesus is baptized and begins a 40-day journey in which he is tempted by the devil, and unlike the first Adam, he overcomes the temptation. And as he comes up from the water of baptism before the temptation, a voice from heaven says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. In Romans, Paul taught us that we were baptized into Christ, which is being baptized into his death and his resurrection. And so put on Christ, says Paul. Get in the van. You understand? Noah's Ark is just like our old blue minivan. The Ark of the Covenant was also like our old blue minivan. And Jesus is the Father's blue minivan. He's the Father in flesh having to come to get us and bring us home to his kingdom, his world. In other words, we baptize our kids in Junction City, Kansas. In other words, they lost their psyche, their cosmos, the world that was, you know, within their grasp that they had constructed and and managed to acquire. They, They lost their psyche for me and my psyche, my cosmos, the magic kingdom. In other words, they made a choice, for I had created that choice in them. I've been growing that choice in them their entire life. In other words, although it hurt, although it was painful, although they experienced it as suffering, they trusted me and got in the van. They surrendered control. Poor Coleman. He was only three at the time. He had been strapped into a car seat for six hours and now he's staring at a playground as, as I said, get in the van? No wonder he had a hard time. I get that. But this is what I was saying to Coleman, although at the time I hadn't put it into these words. I was saying, Coleman, this is the town that I lived in when I was your age. You're sitting on the steps I sat on when I was your age. You're looking at the playground that I used to play in when I was your age. And when I was your age, I gave it all up. I gave it all up because my mommy and my daddy had a dream for me. And although they didn't know it, that dream was you. You are my magic kingdom, Coleman. Coleman, if I would have stayed in the park, I'd be 40 years old now and sleeping under the picnic table and you wouldn't even exist. Coleman, there's only, there's only one way. Coleman, there's only one narrow door. Like the door to Noah's Ark, like the door to the tabernacle, like Jesus himself, it's the door of the van. Now, get in the van. Coleman, I've done it, and now I'm going to do it with you and in you. It hurts me like it hurts you. It hurts me because it hurts you, but get in the van. Coleman, I'm saying, um, I'm saving you. I'm, I'm saving you because you've always been saved, and yet, 
Right now, you're not saved. So get in the van. Just get in the van. Peter told us that we have been begotten of imperishable seed. Think about that. Only God has immortality. I mean, that's, that's pretty dang saved. And yet he also told us that we must, and quote, I quote, grow up into salvation. That's like not saved. <laughs> so get in the van. That's called faith. It's the decision to get in the van. 1 Peter 3, 22. Christ has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. That's an amazing thought. Christ surrendered control, and now he has all control. And what is that? That is absolute freedom. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live for the rest of the time, the chronos in the flesh, no longer in human passions, but in the will of God. And what is the will of God? Well, Jesus is the will of God. Jesus is the van. Get in the van. No longer in human passions, epithumia, but in the will, the thalema, there are a lot of different words for passion and, and will. They all describe desire. No longer in human epithumia, but in the thalema, the will of God, for the time, the chronos that is past suffices for doing uh, the bulema, the will of the unfaithful, moving about in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. That's a fascinating list if you think about it sensuality. Are senses bad? God made your senses. Seeing, hearing, feeling, tasting, smelling. They aren't bad, but they are limited, aren't they? You, in your flesh, your body of flesh, can only see with your own eyes. You can only hear with your own ears. You, you can only feel with, with your own skin, taste with your own tongue, smell with your own nose. But, but what if you could feel what others feel? What would that be called? Compassion. Second, passions, epithumia. As we've noted, Jesus has epithumia. Epithumia, epithumesa, in lust I have lusted to eat this meal with you, said Jesus. Our flesh lusts for isolation. The Spirit of Christ lusts for communion. Have you ever been to Disneyland alone? It's not magic. Drunkenness. Is wine bad? No. It's actually the sign of the covenant. But if we take it as simply our own, it's evil. If we receive it as a gift and so drink it in communion, it's the good. Everything created by God is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, wrote Paul. Take and drink, said Jesus. This is the covenant in my blood. Orgies. If you are asleep, wake up. Is sex bad? It's the very first commandment. Be fruitful and multiply. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh, one body. So what's wrong with orgies? Well, according to Scripture, the sex act forms covenants. It forms a covenant, and that an orgy, people form all these covenants, then break all these covenants, and everybody ends up alone. Drinking parties. What's wrong with drinking parties? Have you ever read about the marriage supper of the Lamb? Sounds like a drinking party. Or the wedding feast at at Cana. Wine isn't bad. It's actually a sign of the kingdom, but it's insanity to sacrifice the kingdom for the sign. And that's what we do when we worship signs. Lawless idolatry. Idolatry is sacrificing the kingdom for the sign rather than the sign for the kingdom. But you know, you can turn idols into sacraments simply by getting in the van and saying, Father, thank you for the signs. Father, thank you for all the stuff you let me see, hear, taste, touch, and smell in Junction City. But I'm ready to go. 
whenever you say, get in the van. You see, Junction City isn't bad. It's actually a necessary stop on the journey. In the same way, Jerusalem is not bad. But the way we hang on to it, the way we take it, the way we kill our brothers and sisters for it, that's like the definition of evil. And what is the good? Well, that's also Jerusalem. The Jerusalem coming down from God, the magic kingdom. And check it out, it's already here. It starts in the van. In 1 Corinthians 10, after Paul writes about being baptized into Christ, you know, just as the Israelites were baptized into Moses, um, he writes that we must not be idolaters, fornicators, and grumblers. And then he says this, on us the end, the telos of the ages has come. And then God is faithful, but with the temptation, he will provide the way of escape. So what is the way of escape? Well, I think he just told us. On us, the end, the telos of the ions, the telos of the ages, has come. In other words, for us, the van has come. So get in the van and get the hell out of Junction City. So where's the van? Preacher, where's the van? Where is the Ark of the Covenant? Where's Jesus? Well, he's in the sanctuary of your soul. And so how do I escape temptation? Well, I, I get into Jesus. And I hear the Father say, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. I think that's how Jesus beat the temptation of the devil. And I think that's how you beat the temptation of the devil. You put on the new man, the consciousness of Christ. In the presence of love, the old man is dissolved and the new man is revealed like gold refined by fire. I, I think we hang on to Junction City trying to make ourselves the beloved. But when we trust that we are the beloved, we can just let it go. That's how you don't get stuck in Junction City. We listen to the Father say, you are my magic kingdom. And I am your magic kingdom. Your desires are not too strong, but too weak. Have hope. Not less, more. Faith is the imperishable seed, and that seed is, remember what Peter said, the living hope. It's the seed that grows into a kingdom. The kids got into the van in Junction City, but they had to keep getting into the van after every potty meal and happy meal all the way to, to Florida, and, and their hope, during that time, their hope grew. In fact, the closer we got to Orlando, the easier it was to just get in the van. You know, I never lied to my kids. And, and I know you think God has lied to you. I never lied to my kids. We, we went to Junction City. We just didn't stay in Junction City. And now, they can go whenever they want. They can go. You see, right at the start of the Bible, Genesis 2, 1 through 3, God tells us, we're all going to the magic kingdom where, quote, everything is good, all is rest, no work, only play, but he doesn't really define it. For we're not yet even able to begin to conceive of, of, of it. And so we naturally think, well, he's only talking about Junction City. Noah and the seven must have thought that the magic kingdom is a world without, you know, the wicked folks that missed the boat. But it's not. It's way, way, way better than that. Moses and Israel must have thought it's a nation named Israel without Palestinians. We're terrorists, but it's not. It's way, 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 way better than that. And the problem now is not that they're hoping for too much, but far, far, far too little. 
The disciples of Jesus still seem to think that heaven is some sort of gated retirement community for those that answer the test correctly, on the test questions correctly on the test while outside everybody else still suffers tortured in the park in Junction City. We seriously need to repent and get in the van. Yeah, we can find a hotel, but after that, I don't know what, what else is there to do? Yeah, you know what, you guys? We've pretty much seen everything. A little miniature golf place. Yeah. We have a bowling alley. But we have a bowling alley at home. Yeah, you might as well go home to do that. Roller skating ring. We can roller skate at home, too. Well, what else could we do? No, we got playgrounds at home. We See. Play here. Hey, what's to the e if we stayed on Interstate 70 and just kept driving, where would we go? Well, you keep on going far enough, you get to the other side of the United States, the east side. You can take if you want to get even hotter, you can then take the interstates angling down. I don't know. I think go it's to hot Florida. Enough here. It's hot enough here. Okay. How far is Florida? Oh. Let's see, about 1,500 miles. 1,500, what do they have, what did that be like, what do they have in Florida? I don't know, you know anything that's in Florida? Alligators? Yeah. Uh, I wonder, crocodiles. Crocodiles, anything to do to play there? Um, Disney World? Yeah. Oh, hey, you wanna go to Disney World? I'd rather be here. What? You'd rather be here? John, do you wanna go to Disney World? I'll think about that one. You think about it? Well, we'll stay here if you want. But Yeah, I'm totally serious. We're driving two more days to Disney World. And then we're going to go to the beach. I'm going to follow. <laughs> Just get in the van. <laughs> what would have happened if my kids didn't get in the van? I mean, what would have happened? What would I have done if... Coleman just screamed, no daddy, and he ran across the street and hid under the picnic table in the park. I would have yelled, I love you, Coleman, but I respect your free will. And then I would have shut the van door, taking the other kids to the Magic Kingdom, and when Coleman called me 40 years later saying, Dad, I live in the park under the picnic table, and every day I'm tortured by gangs of Kansas farm boys with sunburns, and, and, and Dad, I want to come home. I'm ready to get in the van. I'd respond, it's impossible. For I'm not only love, I'm also just. And Coleman, you made your choice. That's the BS we tell people. That's child abuse. I wouldn't have done that. But I might have shut the door and driven around the block. Because you know, there are some parables that say something like that. And once I did that, by accident, it was about two years later on vacation in California, San Ramon's, at, in, at the Lucky's in San, San Ramon. I said, get in the van, and then I forgot to count. I looked in the rearview mirror, so we're driving out of the parking lot, and I see my five-year-old son, Coleman, running after the van. He desperately wanted to get in the van. <laughs> Having gained the knowledge of evil, he desperately longed for the good. He wanted to get in the van. Well, I'm just saying, I, I wouldn't have taken the other kids without Coleman. And actually, I wouldn't have even driven around the block without Coleman, at least not when he was a little child. And you do have to become like a little child, you know, to enter. If my kids hadn't gotten into the van, I, I would have remained in Junction City with them. In other words, Susan and I would have descended into hell with them. And then after three weeks of sitting in front of the Tasty Freeze in 100 degree heat, as they moaned and complained, we'd say, hey, let's get in the van. In other words, I might have allowed their bad choice for a time in order that my good choice might become their free choice in time. Maybe that's why God made time. Remember, hell number one is in time. 
Hell number two is the magic kingdom, the kingdom of heaven. And hell number three is getting in the van. It's the judgment of God. It's the presence of the future. It's the tree in the middle of the garden. It's the cross. It's the telos at hand. Next verse. With respect to this, they are surprised when you do not now join them in the same flood of debauchery, and they malign you. But they will give or give back Logos, account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is why the gospel was preached even to those who are dead, that though judged in the flesh, the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. I preached gospel to my kids in Junction City. And imagine if while I was preaching that, Pastor Underhall Pierce, he leaned over and whispered in Coleman's ear, you better get in the van, for if you don't, your daddy will torture you forever and ever and ever without end, just as he's doing to some of your brothers and sisters right now. Well, you see, Coleman might have gotten in the van, but he would not have been able to arrive in the Magic Kingdom, for in his soul he would have been utterly trapped and alone. And it is not good for the Adam to be alone. For this is why the gospel was preached even to those who are dead, that though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. The end, the telos of all things is at hand. The telos was my judgment. But after Junction City, it was our judgment. At first, it was only the size of a, of a mustard seed, but it grew and became a, a, a kingdom. So as I was asking, why the journey? I mean, we asked that, right? What the frick am I doing here? I mean, God, you're rich and powerful. I've said that to him many times. I mean, you don't, why this? I'm, he's rich and powerful. He doesn't have to drive. He can transport folks like Scotty on Star Trek, you know? He even did that in Acts chapter 8. Remember with Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch, all that, all that stuff? So why the journey and why the stop in Junction City at all? Why the journey and why all of this suffering? I'm convinced that I cannot answer that question fully. But I want to tell you that although I didn't plan it to go the way it did, if I had it to do over Again, I, I would do it exactly the same way. For our confusing and painful stop in Junction City just made the magic kingdom all the more magic. Over and over and over again, it, it would happen. We'd be standing in line for one more ride on Space Mountain. I swear we rode it like 50 times. Or we'd be eating those giant turkey legs they call alien legs. Or walking on the beach late at night under the moon looking for sea turtles laying their eggs in the sand. And one of the kids would just stop me. They'd look up with those eyes and their eyes would just get huge. And they'd say, Daddy, I, I can't believe I wanted to stay in Junction City. I love you. You know, all sorts of folks visit the Magic Kingdom. Or Disney World. And they just have a hell of a time. I mean, it really feels like hell. They may be part of a huge crowd or a big family and, and yet feel utterly alone. In fact, that's where we often feel most alone, isn't it? In a crowd. They're in the magic kingdom, and it's far worse than a sticky hot day in Junction City, Kansas, because they don't have faith and hope in love. And it's love that binds all things together. So why the journey? Well, like I said, I can't answer it completely, but I know that faith, hope, and love grow on the journey in us. And faith, hope, and love are the ability to enjoy the magic kingdom when we arrive. So Junction City is not a test to see who gets to go to the magic kingdom. 
Junction City is a test so that we can enjoy the magic kingdom when we arrive. It tests our faith. Like gold refined by fire. Faith, hope, and love make the magic kingdom magic, and faith, hope, and love are grown in the van, and that means that the magic kingdom begins in the van. But the magic kingdom is eternal. Faith, hope, and love abide. The kids were, uh, <laughs> sorry, they're all home for Christmas. <laughs> And like usual, we told stories about vacation, and it's just fascinating to me that none of them seem to miss Disney World. Not one of them has suggested that we go back, and yet all of them seem to really cherish our time in the van. That is the telos that is always at hand. The kingdom of heaven is at hand, said Jesus. So we're going to revisit this story and talk about that uh, next week. But before you go, I, I want to remind you, because this is really important. You'll listen to this, you'll walk out of the church, stub your toe, and get angry at God. I, I want you to just remind you that for a three-year-old, after six hours in a car seat, get in the van really did sound like pick up your cross and come follow. And I would remind you that, that Peter did as he was fleeing Rome and the persecutions under Nero, he had a vision of Jesus coming down the road or up the road in the other direction carrying a cross. And he said, my Lord, where are you going? And he said, I'm going to Rome to be crucified. And at that, Peter got in the van. He returned to Rome and he was crucified with Jesus because he wanted to. He wanted to be with Jesus. In other words, he was saved. And that's the judgment of God. Salvation. You can hide for a time, but there's an end to all things, and his name is salvation. God is salvation. Yahweh, Yasha, Yeshua, Jesus. Let us conclude the matter with a parable, writes A.T. Robinson. To man, there remains two ways, a junction. Two ways, and the one that is crowded is still the one that leads to destruction, and many there be that find it. But at some point on that road, be it far or near, each one finds also something or rather someone else. It is a figure stooping beneath the weight of a cross. Lord, where are you going? asks every man. And the answer comes, I'm going to Rome, to Moscow, to New York, to be crucified afresh in your place. And no man in the end can bear that encounter forever. For it is an encounter with a power than which there can be nothing greater, a meeting with omnipotent love itself. This love will take no man's choice from him, for it is precisely his choice it wants. It is our choice that it creates. Its will to lordship is inexhaustible and ultimately unendurable. The sinner must yield. God has exposed the strong right, the strong right arm by which he has declared that he will curb the nations. And lo, it is pierced by nails, stained with blood, and riveted in impotence. Is it to us to an offense and foolishness? Yet this is the authentic quality of love's omnipotence. The weakness of God is stronger than men, than any man. For I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto myself, said Jesus. Christ, in Origen's old words, remains on the cross so long as one sinner remains in hell. This is not speculation. It is a statement grounded in the very necessity of God's nature. In a universe of love, there can be no heaven which tolerates a chamber of horrors, no hell for any which does not at the same time make it hell for God. He cannot endure that, for that would be the final mockery of his nature, and he will not. And so on the night he was betrayed by all of us, he took bread and he broke it. 
saying, this is my body given to you. Take and eat and do it in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper and having given thanks, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the covenant, an eternal covenant. It's the covenant in my blood poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, all of you. In other words, all of you get in the van. And so uh, we arrived at the Magic Kingdom. And I have to tell you that like on about the 50th time on Space Mountain, it got old. Not only for me, but for also, also for John. And then after a while, we kind of even got grumpy with each other. And it created some separation. Because we hadn't yet arrived. <laughs> But we all long for that place, the telos, where nothing gets old and everything is constantly new and there is no separation. So we're not there yet. And yet in this really weird way, there is here and it begins in the van. So like I look at that video of my kids and I, I mean, I seriously can hardly hold it together and it hurts. There's this longing for them. Last night I talk to Coleman, you know, and I mean, each of my kids has gone these different routes. So if you think, oh, this is a perfect family, they have the, and they go, no, <laughs> we're still on, on the journey. And yet talking to Coleman, I still see, I go, he's there. That, that kid, go to the park, is still, still there in the soul of a PhD. And, 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 and I experience it for a moment. And you see, I want you to know that I'm not a great dad. It all has like kind of surprised me. But that's just the picture that God has created within us. And that's the way, the way I look at that picture in my kids, and I know that you, but some of you have kids, the way I look at that is the way God looks at you. And, and when you look at God and he's your vision, there's a reflection in the pupil of his eye. It's the apple of his eye. And you're the apple of his eye. And so it doesn't matter where you are, where you are on the journey, what your story is, whether you have kids or you don't have kids, you're all the apple of his eye. And when you really look into each other with the eyes of Jesus, that's what you'll see. And that's the magic kingdom. So next week we'll try to talk about it a little bit, but the best I can do is just go, wow, I, I think this could be true. I think this could be true. I think this could be true. I think all of the Bible is true, but we haven't believed it because we're so addicted to Junction City. So hopefully you'll come next week, but all I'm saying this whole time is just believe the gospel in Jesus' name. Amen.